ask the chair uh, of that speaking committee, Councillor Sallian, to introduce the item. Councillor Sallian. Thank you, Chairman. Um, another significant issue um, besides community assets in, in our towns and villages is access to GPs. Um, for a long time, Beverage residents have been telling its politicians um, they can't get a, an appointment with their doctor. Um, we've got a fairly well-established understanding among certainly the politicians nowadays that the public um, don't necessarily have to always see a doctor, um, but a nurse or indeed uh, nowadays what the NHS term is direct primary care practitioners. And for example, those are pharmacists, physiotherapists, mental health professionals, social prescribers and, and health and well-being coaches. So you can, as a resident, go direct to those primary care practitioners um, before even contemplating a nurse or a fully fledged doctor. Um, but it continues to be an issue, and it's fairly well recorded in local media that the clinical commissioning group, part of the NHS, uh, does have some significant challenges in recruiting and retaining all manner of primary uh, medical staff. So the Scrutiny Committee for Social Care, Health and Housing has um, been looking at this issue uh, for quite some time. Um, recently, we had a meeting where the CCG attended, and you'll see uh, Chairman in convene page 30, the recommendations that came from that fairly extensive uh, meeting. So it's right that we spend some time investigating the problem, uh, but trying to remind people that it's not this council's responsibility to fix the NHS lack of supply of clinicians but to help the NHS, uh, and specifically the clinical commissioning group, which will soon morph into, a, uh, into an integrated care system. Um, however, due to our democratic mandate, it seems to me, and a number of you here today I've spoken to before about this, it seems to me that we are in the best position, local government, because we have a democratic mandate to hold the NHS to account and to help and challenge them so the recommendations, Chairman, particularly number one, talk about um, working with the CCG, encouraging them to integrate with us, be completely open and transparent about what the problem and the challenge is for them, uh, and to allow us to help them in lobbying central government or NHS EI or whoever it may be. But I think the time has, has come, in fact long past, for us to work jointly in solving this wicked issue for our residents. Um, so we've obtained some data, of which on page 30 there's a hyperlink. If you go to the second one where it says CCG presentation, uh, it shows the data that we managed to, um, that the CCG shared with the scrutiny committee. Uh, and it was, if I can be candid, and I have discussed this with the directors of the CCG, it was difficult to get this data. Um, and they acknowledge that it shouldn't be, but it was, which is part of the problem with the way the system is currently operating in the NHS. But to get meaningful data that can be interpreted takes months, as it seems. Um, and uh, hopefully if all members of executive can see that data, uh, what it tells us is, which is a question that's been long asked, but not much advertised since the scrutiny meeting, um, those primary care networks, which essentially are a cluster of three or four GP practices, will see an increase just of the primary care practitioners, so not nurses and not doctors, just of these um, other types of clinical staff, an increase from 101.5 to 156.5 over the next three years. I don't think there's a total column at the bottom, but you'll see those um, PCNs on the left-hand column. When you add them up at the bottom, it comes to 101.5, increasing to 156.5. So there's been a bit of confusion recently, but I can clarify for you here today, Chairman, that's an increase of 55 over three years of direct primary care practitioners. So that's the physiotherapists, the pharmacists, the mental health, the social prescribers, not nurses and doctors. So that's very good news for central beds, isn't it? 
However, at the scrutiny meeting uh, six weeks ago, we came to the point where it was revealed that the clinical commissioning group were unable to provide the number of GPs and nurses, which a lot of residents, particularly the older generation, still regard as um, uh, <laughs> what, who they want to see. Let's, let's, let's say they expect to see their, their family doctor, which I'm afraid is an outdated concept. So when we probed, uh, and the CCG are fully cited on this, so I'm not embarrassing anybody. When we probed, the CCG are unable to provide that number on top of the 55, how many practice nurses and GPs because it's not in their gift. Um, they can have aspirations, and, and the aspiration is about a dozen um, that we think our PCNs, our GP practices, will need due to population growth in the house building and, and births. Um, but they can't be precise because it's not in their gift because of the way the system is designed. Uh, and many of us who know the NHS have, have long been uh, making that observation that the way that it's structured is peculiar. So finally, Chairman, the three recommendations. Number one is to ask your executive to continue to work and encourage the CCG to share its challenges with us so that we can lobby and influence and argue with our members of parliament and with government to change the system and make it easier or at least less difficult um, to recruit GPs and nurses. Um, and, but also to recognize and to perhaps um, um, help the public understand that GPs and nurses are not the be-all and end-all of delivering primary health care. Um, uh, and I think we have a role to play in that, politicians do, and when we talk to our electorate at ward surgeries and emails, um, you, know, you don't necessarily have to see a GP and a nurse, there are alternatives. The second recommendation uh, is around key worker housing. Uh, again, in, in my 10 years on this council, it's come up from schools, police, fire brigade, um, a, a number of areas, and of course, healthcare and social care. And I think rather than continuing to say this is too difficult an issue to um, believe will be solvable uh, through key worker housing, because that's what head teachers and, and NHS staff are telling me and others we could do with some help from the council with key worker housing. Uh, the committee felt strongly, as I do as its chair, that, that perhaps we at least instruct officers to look at the viability of such a policy. And, and the viability may come back as, as, as unviable, and that's the end of that. But let's at least be seen to try. And then finally, Chairman, the third recommendation is around the, the public assets team looking at better use and, and maximizing use of community asset buildings, not just our own that are owned by Central Coast Council, um, but throughout our villages and towns, their own um, village halls and so on. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Salian. Uh, so I, I will respond in the, in the first instance to this. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, your scrutiny committee and yourself for uh, the information that's been provided and the detailed consideration that's been given uh, and the points that, that you've raised, which I think you know, we all agree are uh, central to the well-being of our residents. And <coughs> I think you know, that it's, it, it's, it's something that, that's, that's fundamental to quality of life for all of us uh, and fundamental to supporting our residents overall that the provision of health care uh, in our area is seen to be the best uh, that can be achieved with the available resources and of course there's always a call for, for more resources be it uh, money or healthcare practitioners or more GPs uh, and, and certainly the statistics that this scrutiny committee have, have brought to us after I appreciate some uh, difficulty in necessarily obtaining the information quickly um, you know, show that uh, we have a massive need in this area partly because I think we were starting from a position where we were overall under-resourced, but also, of course, you know, we're one of the fastest growing areas in the country, and it's clear that provision has not kept up with that growth. So whilst this executive and this council, and as you rightly pointed out, uh, Chair, have no uh, direct ability to uh, influence the, the, uh, uh, the NHS in its various forms in, in the area, uh, it's, we do have duty uh, and a responsibility to lobby for that provision to be made 
and we do that a number of ways, obviously through your scrutiny committee, through the Health and Wellbeing Board, and, uh, amongst others, uh, and by uh, lobbying through our MPs. And in fact, only this week I've had an interaction with, with one of our MPs about uh, primary care networks. So, you know, turning to uh, the particular uh, recommendations, you know, these, these recommendations, I think, are likely to be uh, pursued in the main through our Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, but they are absolutely worthy of, of further, more detailed consideration. Uh, and to that end, I would like to uh, uh, suggest a recommendation that officers be asked to consider these recommendations and the evidence provided from scrutiny uh, and bring back a report uh, suggesting further actions uh, to a future meeting of the executive. Uh, and with that, I'll move that recommendation uh, and then open the discussion to further debate. But I'm sure there will be uh, more comments uh, explicitly on the individual recommendations. So thank you. Is that seconded, please? It's seconded, Chairman. Clark. So I'm opening it now to uh, debate with non-executive members in the first instance. Would any non-executive member like to speak? Councillor Goodchild. Yes, um, thank you. Good morning and thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank Councillor Vassalian for diligently bringing this to the attention of the Executive. Um, I won't repeat anything that he said, but I fully endorse everything he said. Um, and as a ward member for an area that is seeing an extremely rapid growth in the community, one of the significant um, challenges that we face in Houghton Regis is actually um, the constraints of the sites. So the medical centre, as one I can speak, you know, um, with regard to that, is that they would love to deliver more services to support the growing needs of our community, but there is absolutely no opportunity um, you know, to expand the site. And I suppose I'm very well aware that Central Bedfordshire Council's officers are working tirelessly behind the scenes to look at opportunities for, um, for health hubs. And I think, you know, this certainly, um, you know, supports the integrated care system. But one of my challenges and concerns is what are we going to be doing in the interim? I'm very well aware with the Houghton Regis North um, Outline Planning Commission, that being the linear site, um, there's a piece of land for a GP surgery, but my understanding is that it's in the wrong place. And um, more importantly, there is actually no capital to do anything with. So really, I just am here today to offer my full support to Councillor Vassalian, members of the um, Social Care, Health and Housing Community um, Overview and Scrutiny C Committee, but more importantly, our residents. And, you know, I really welcome the fact that at least we are going to be, um, you know, t treating this very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goodchild. Uh, Councillor Harvey. I'd just like to add my support to all the great work Councillor Vassalian and his committee are doing, which is much appreciated by residents in Nathan Buzzard, who are also really struggling to get appointments. Um, I completely support the approach of encouraging people to look for physio and other forms of health and social prescribing. But to echo a theme, we have a shortage of venues in order for those facilities to take place, which could take pressure off healthcare in Nathan Buzzard. And that could help enormously with taking the strain off the surgeries. So I'm very grateful to Councillor Vassalian's work. Thank you. Any other non-executive members wish to speak? Not seeing any, so we'll move now to executive members. Executive members wish to speak on this item. Uh, Councillor Stock. Thank you, Leader. <coughs> Excuse me, and thank you, um, Councillor Vassalian, for, for bringing this to, uh, uh, to this committee. Um, and of course, I support for clarity of data, um, accurate data, <coughs> and the need to work closely with our CCG colleagues. Um, and as you highlighted, 
the local authority isn't responsible for general practice. Um, but we, and we also need to acknowledge the huge pressure that they have been under, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and also the pressures on the system as a whole. We know that, uh, I think the figures are around 60% of our GPs nationally are retirement age. And we know that medical students aren't coming out of, you know, graduating, coming into general practice. So there's a huge pressure there. <clears throat> But I would like to uh, just highlight that the, the report that I'm bringing, uh, item 18, uh, it does highlight the new way of working and that very much focusing, as you say, working collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with our NHS and health colleagues, <coughs> particularly support for our general practices um, with the use of multidisciplinary teams, etc. Um, you also mentioned about uh, your third um, point about estates, when you mentioned public estates team, I mean, directing them, I thought you meant about the NHS public estates team, which obviously we, we cannot direct them what to do. Um, but then you, you did go on to say about um, our own facilities and, and our village halls, um, which we, we know that a lot of our village halls we don't actually own and run. And also when you're setting up um, facilities for GP practice, you have to take in consideration, it's not just uh, consulting space, you know, there are other, if they do bloods and things, there has to be um, facilities within that space to be able to accommodate um, that, so it is very difficult. But I, I, I would welcome you to bring this to the Health and Wellbeing Board as well, as our leader has said, because that's where we have our NHS and health colleagues around the table that you can, you know, put these questions to them. And I know that you offer challenge <coughs> at the Social Care Health and Housing Scrutiny Meeting, but the Health and Wellbeing Board is another avenue that you can use. Thank you.